few would have considered it a silent night, a holy night. Travelers jostled in the city gates. Weary fists pounded on closed doors, pleading on the outside, arguing from within, all to the same refrain, no room. Among the houses rang raucous Roman laughter, census takers with comfortable quarters, and plenty of food and wine. There is little peace and less goodwill between stranger and villager here. Somewhere a dog barked, a lamb bleated, a woman moaned, and a baby cried. Out on the hillsides, exposed to the cold night, without even a stable for warmth, shepherds huddled around the fire, guarding their flocks against thieves and wolves. Suddenly, a light to split the darkness, a voice, a song, a chorus of angels. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a child, a son, a shepherd, a king, a savior which is Christ the Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill to men. Awaken, O little town that cannot sleep. Hear the shepherd's words. The angel's message. And arise to a sound unfamiliar. The triumph of joy. So I've had numerous people ask me, Brad, are, are we a week early on Advent? I, I want to let you know, we're not. Just the rest of the world is a week behind. <laughs> I, listen, I'm old school. I, I believe Advent starts the very first Sunday after Thanksgiving, right? Listen, every seven years, the calendar's just a little wonky, like me. And so you just a little grace, but, but we're on track because we want to have that celebration service Sunday morning on Christmas Eve. Amen. We as a church decided we were just going to have a Sunday morning celebration service. It's going to be a combined service with our Filipino ministry and all of that. Uh, we don't want to act, understand when I say this. I don't want you to feel that you have to always be doing religious services when sometimes you need to be Jesus to your family. Amen. And it's important at Christmas Eve to you know, there's tons of churches to go to if you want, but sometimes I want to give our staff the ability to go home, to be with their families. And, and that's just not me. Susan and I are going to be, her and I again, but, but we've got people up here playing on the platform to have children. And we have others, so we want them to be home. Does that make sense? And, and so we're just timing everything just right, and believe it or not, it's going to fit perfectly in God's order, and we're going to have a great Christmas Eve service at 11 a.m., and, and then you can go home and, and eat whatever you want, just no pork as always, you know. <laughs> you don't celebrate a Jewish man's birth by giving him pork, just so you know, right? A Christmas goose, I, I grew up on, on stuff, you know, Ian's doing this program tonight, a Christmas goose is perfect. That, and especially if I'm the one who takes it out of the air, that's even better, right? But as we're moving in, today is joy, if you noticed earlier. And, and as we've progressed through this, we, we started thinking about some things, and, and it all originated in the little card we gave you um, early on. It's like, what do you need? Think about it. What do you need for you to be Okay. And by okay, I mean not just happy, not just joyous, but to be at peace. What, what do you need? What do you need to complete your life that seems to be missing? And, and many of you listed many things, what you need. And we have Christmas, and, and you're going to get gifts, but I, I have a feeling what you need and what I need cannot be put under the tree, right? I'm going to let you know, God's already given me my gift, and there's many more gifts to, to be given, but, but what I needed, you could not put under a tree. It's, it's what is in my heart, amen? And so we've, we've 
taken steps along this process and the journey of peace. We want peace for Christmas. It's a gift and it's the gift that Jesus Christ brings us, right? And so many times we remember Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. But if you remember during communion, uh, the whole Eucharist, as Jesus is breaking bread with the disciples, he's still alive and he says, do this in remembrance of me. He's not talking about his death. He hadn't died yet. He's, he's not talking about his resurrection. He's talking about the way we are to live, the, the example he gave us. And Jesus speaks a lot about peace. As a matter of fact, his disciples and, and everyone after Jesus, peace is an important message. And, and so we talked about peace and, and how we find peace. And we talked about that Jesus is before the world, right? I'm not going to say the P word again today, right? But Jesus is before everything. No matter how you vote, no matter what you do, what you think, Jesus is before that. If you want peace in your life, you've got to put Jesus in front of all your agendas, before all your worries, before all your problems, before all your concerns, before all your complaining. Right? We complain a lot about the world, don't we? I do. I get frustrated when I look at the world, but I got to put Jesus in front of it. And how does Jesus deal with these problems? And, and what does Jesus want me to do with this? And how do I handle this? How would Jesus handle it? And when I ask myself that question, I got to go to the word of God. How did Jesus handle this? I don't know if you know every problem you're facing. So did he. Jesus faced all kinds of ridicule, never fully being accepted. He was homeless. He had issues with his siblings, right? He, he had everything you and I go through. So if, if I want to know how to go through my problems and, and how the world should solve their problems, I'm going to put Jesus first. You tracking with me? That's a great way to, to right off the bat get peace. And, and then last week we talked about another aspect to get peace is there's three more steps. One, we got to stop being at war with, with God. We got to submit our lives to God. Right? You and I are born with sinful nature, so there's always this indifference between our will and God's will for us. And, and the way to get peace is you got to settle that. You and I need to submit our lives to God. He knows what's best. You and I have these desires, and they're, they may be in a box this big, but God's desires for you are much better. But you're never going to know until you submit yourself to God. The next way is you need to learn to love yourself. In the world we live in, we have so many people... We don't like ourselves. We suffer from insecurity. We let other people tell us that we're, we're too tall, we're too short, we're too thin, we're too round. Um, we're, we're this and we're that. And we listen and Satan just echoes that in our brain. And, and as we grow up, we learn not to love ourselves. How many kids do you think could be on this worship team if somebody else in their school told them, you can't sing? You ever hear kids tell each other that? You can't do this. You can't do that. And what happens as we grow up, we are telling our own selves this. Well, I can't accomplish this. I can't accomplish this. And then we stand in the mirror and we don't like the way we look. We don't like what we do. We don't like anything about ourselves. Listen, you're a creation of God. God created you. He favors you more than any mountain or ocean or star or moon or sky above. And if God loves you that much, why aren't you loving yourself so much? And you're, we're not supposed to look the same. Praise God, you don't look like me, right? Amen. Listen, it takes a lot of time to look this bad. You, you don't want this, right? But if you look around, like I said, God is the coloring box of all the crayons. As a poor kid, I barely had six crayons in a box. But God's box is a big crayon. So, so love the melatonin in your hands and your face and, and, and love. If, if you're a woman, be happy you're a woman. I, I love a good, strong leadership woman. And I love a good, strong leadership man. That's the way God created you. Listen, I, I hear so much about toxic masculinity. And believe it or not, there's toxic femininity. And why don't we just stop being toxic and love each other? That's the third part. Let's love God, let's love ourselves, and let's love each other, right. right? The Bible says a whole lot about loving ourselves and each other and forgiving ourselves and forgiving others. These are important aspects of finding peace in your life. 
Think about everything you're, you're battling through, everything you're stressing out. It, it's usually you're self-deprecating yourself or you're upset over what somebody else did. And all these things get us upset. So here's what I want to ask this morning as we talk about joy and peace is what's got you upset? I mean, what happens in your life when things go wrong? What happens to your peace? What happens to your joy? When things aren't going your way. I know many times we're raised in atmosphere and say, life's going to have problems, right? Even Jesus says this, in this world you will have problems, but be of good cheer. I've overcame the world. But sometimes we forget about that scripture when we go through a hard time, right? When maybe our kids are acting up. I don't know if y'all raised teenagers. They can be a handful, right? Like this morning I got up, I had a little Dax on my lap. Oh, I love that little young man. Oh, I love him. Lindy's going to leave him with me, right? Man, we got up. We had an early morning watching Charlie Brown Christmas. Then we watched Veggie Tail Christmas. Oh, I had church early this morning. But I haven't told Lindy this. Don't tell her. He's going to be a teenager someday. <laughs> and there may be trouble, Right? How many times do we get stressed? We, we don't have the money we want. Oh, what do we do when, when you get that you know, notice in the mail about your power being turned off? What do you do when you're worried about your job? What, what happens to our faith? What, what happens to our peace when hard times come our way? Do you lose your peace? Do you, do you get sour? Do you get upset? You start blaming God. God, I love you, and, and this is what you do to me. Lord, I... I pay my tip, I mean my tithe every Sunday, and, and this is how you reward me. You ever do that? I have. I've yelled at God, to be honest. I think God's big enough for it. But I got to admit, that was pretty early on in my relationship with God, right? Because I've realized along the way, God loves me. And some of y'all will be like, Lord, when are you going to send me Prince Charming? Lord, when are you going to send me Miss Charming? Lord, I you see I'm hurting. Lord, I've lost my spouse. Lord, I've lost a child. And you wonder where God is, if God sees you. I understand those are painful moments. I know there's many watching online this morning. They've been the same way. Listen, I want to let you know what happens to your peace during a hard time. I want you to think about this morning, what's been the hardest part of your life? Well, what's been the thing that just seemed to cripple you and crush you? Did your relationship and trust in God stay intact? Or did you start blaming him? See, a lot of times when something bad happens, we, we begin to not only lose our joy, but we lose our peace. And that slowly erodes, erodes at our trust in God and who he is and that he sees us and cares for us. I don't know about you, but I know the Apostle Paul he goes through some of the worst things anybody could imagine. But Paul is this amazing prophet, right? Here in a minute, you can meet me in Philippians chapter 4. And we're just going to read the first four, four verses. But there's something amazing about this letter that Paul writes. And Paul is writing a letter to the church he started in Philippi. And, and so here's what's interesting. And I want you to check me this afternoon. There's only four chapters in the book of Philippians. There's roughly only just a hundred verses. It's a quick read. But oddly enough, in almost every seven verses, the apostle Paul says joy or joyous. Sounds like Paul's life is pretty good at this time, doesn't it? I mean, when we're on fire, when things are going right, we're super duper happy. We're excited, right? We're walking on water. We're floating because things are right. And you would think the Apostle Paul is having the time of his life. So let's, let's see what Paul has to write in Philippians 4, verses 1 through 4. Here's what it says. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, he's talking about you guys. You whom I love and long for, my joy, my crown. Stand for him in the Lord in his way, dear friends. I plead with Eurodia and with Sentry to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have continued at my side and the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. 
Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again. Rejoice! Exclamation point. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us this morning to rejoice in you. No matter what season of life we're going through, what trials and tribulations we have, Lord, would you be with us this morning? Remind us that we can have joy no matter what's going on in our lives. Lord, maybe there are people here this morning struggling quietly, walking in and having a facade on their face and the insides in pain. Lord, would you tend to them this morning? Lord, maybe it's people watching online who couldn't come to church this morning. Or maybe they're watching somewhere else and tears roll down their face because of the anguish they may feel. Lord, would you care for them as well? Show grace and mercy, but Lord, show your passion and love. Let them feel your presence through the Holy Spirit this morning. Lord, we know you love us, but sometimes people are so wounded, it's hard to feel love. And we question your trust. Lord, would you remind us this morning, we can always trust in you. You said in your word, you would never leave us nor forsake us. So Lord, let us feel your presence through the Holy Spirit this morning to know you're still there. You still care. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's something going on that, that maybe you and I are missing this morning. And, and I want to give you a, a, an indication of what Paul's going through. Now remember, ever seven verses, Paul is talking about joy or being joyous. You would think that maybe Paul, Paul is somewhere in, in the Caribbean or in Puerto Vallarta. He's under a Tahiti hut. He, he's taken off his outer garment. He's in some board shorts in the sun by the beach just taking it easy, huh? No, he's far from that. Paul writes this letter while he's in prison. Not just any prison, he's in a Roman prison. And I don't know if you know, the Romans were brutal. They were some of the most brutal people in the world at that point in time. And so here Paul is in prison. Probably believing his life is about to end. Believing he's about to be headed. He's going to go through so much pain and torture before they brutally kill him. But he's talking about joy. He's talking, hey, help this person, help that person. And he says, and I say it again, rejoice. I don't know if you know this, but in the Roman prison, in the winter time, and they have winter, it was awful cold. The staff make fun of me. I get cold. Even here in California, I got a space heater underneath my desk, right? It gets down to 70. I'm telling you, folks, I get cold. People forget I moved here from Colorado. I don't know what the Lord has done to me. Apparently, I'm a Southern California boy now, right? But Paul is cold. He's in a prison. No, he's about to die, and he's cold. I mean, really cold. But in the summertime, he's hot. See, they didn't have a furnace in the prisons then, right? We talk about how bad prisons are now, and don't get me wrong, they're bad. But Paul's in prison, and there's no heaters. Matter of fact, there's not even air conditioning. I don't know if you've ever been around stone, sitting on stone or concrete when it's cold or hot. It's not comfortable, is it? That's what Paul is going through. But the Romans, they were a little more sadistic than that. When it was the in-between seasons, you know, the temperature is just right. They wanted to make sure that Paul was even more uncomfortable. So they would chain him to a Roman guard. Sound like somebody wants to talk about joy? Paul must have known something that sometimes we forget. Right? We, we go through hard times, and I'm not discounting the hard times you're going through or some of the struggles you're going through. But, but trust me, Paul's going through a really, really rough time. And I'll talk more about it here in a minute. But what did Paul know that, that maybe you and I are missing, right? Paul has to know something that you and I don't for him to be in such a positive state of mind, to have his relationship with God intact, when so many times you and I go through something small, something trivial, and we get all bent out of shape, right? Right? You ever think about that? You ever see somebody go through something really small and they're all bent out of shape? Eminem, the rapper, in one of his songs, he says this, the hardest thing you've been through is your mama's purse, right? You mamas know when we took your money out of your purse, we were going to get a dollar and you probably whooped us for it, right? But you ever see somebody go through something just simple and they're in pain? 
But then you see other people go through devastation, right? You ever notice those going through devastation are almost always quiet because words can't even describe the pain they're going through. They just stand there and they have tears. But people go through a little pain. They're very vocal. They're always talking. They're always a victim. But those going through real pain, usually pretty silent. That's just a little knowledge for you for whenever you're ministering to people in the name of Jesus Christ. Because sometimes it's not the words you need to look at. Sometimes we got to look at people's eyes. And behind the eyes, we can see real pain, real hurt. And, and I believe God puts those people in your path for you to share your faith, for you to say a prayer with. Amen? You're tracking with me? But Paul is going through a hard time. And, and Paul's not being a victim. And, and Paul's not being quiet. Matter of fact, Paul has a different aspect. Paul takes a totally different view. He's like, hey, hey, help, help you, Rhodia. Help, Sinchi. Oh, oh, don't forget about Clement. Help Clement, right? That's old school, isn't it? When someone's talk- Those are old school names, by the way, right? But I don't know if you know that the Bible is kind of old, right? And, but Paul, Paul's like, help, help this lady in, and help that lady in, and, and help, help Clement because they help me. And so you need to help them while I'm not there. Paul is not worried about himself. How would you and I be in that time? Probably a little bit different, wouldn't we? I think we can learn how to handle things if we just put Jesus first. If we just put God first and we, we look in the Bible, hey, what are these people going through? How did they handle it? I think Paul figured this out because Paul knew the difference between happiness and joy. There's a, a huge difference. See, the truth of it is, we always say that, oh, happiness is exterior, da da da. Listen, I'm going to tell you now, here, here's the truth. Happiness is dependent on your environment, right? What's going on? What do you got? Or what don't you got? Or what's got you? Right? That's a better phrase, that last one. What's got you? That seems to be our world these days, doesn't it? It it depends on how much money you're making. It depends on if you got the degree you want. If your car's running good. If your spouse is being good to you. If your kids are being perfect. Everything about our happiness depends on our environment. Our joy, this, depends on the relationship. You think about this. Your joy depends on the relationship. That relationship is a relationship with Jesus Christ, the one who died for you, the one who resurrected for you. I mean, listen, I, it, it, it's never happened in my house. It may have happened in your spouse. We you have an argument with your spouse. Never, never happened to me, never. right? We perfect, right? But you ever notice when couples argue, you still love each other? You know why? It's about the relationship. Man. Same is true with God. You, you can be upset at God all you want. He still loves you. You can have the great pity party, right? You can throw the baby fit. I, I remember one time I, I was on a hunting trip and I was hunting a bear, right? And I was upset and I decided I was going to have the great pity party. So I'm in my little blind. It's only about this tall and I just like, forget it. Lord, have a bear come meet me. And I just lay down. Bear never came along. Obviously, I'm here. Right? Well. <laughs> There's so much I want to say, but I'm not. Uh, <laughs> but we get that way. We have baby fits and pity parties because of our emotions, because of the environment. The truth of it is about a really, how is your relationship to God? I'm not, listen, I'm not discounting your pain. I'm not discounting your, 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 your hurt. That's far from that. It's normal. Even Jesus in the garden the night before said, Father, if there's any other way. When he's with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus is dying, the, the shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. Jesus had emotions. You're going to have emotions. But God's with you in those. God's with you in the pain. Uh, in, in the pain, how are you seeing God? Are you realizing he's going to get you through? I, I was saying this the other day. Listen, I, I grew up, I'm an 80s kid. One of the great things about being an 80s kid, we had good TV, right? We did. BJ and the Bear, the truck driver with a monkey. That's good stuff, right? We had the A-team, right? 
I would get out of school and watch Gilligan's Island, Hogan's Heroes, and Andy Griffin, right? But one of my favorites, not Gomer Pyle was okay. But in the evening, I got to watch Sanford and Son, right? You've heard me say this. Every week, Fred Sanford went through something, didn't he? And he'd start bobbling, holding it. This is a big one, Wheezy. And we get like that. We think this is the one that's going to get us. Instead of realizing the one who got us. God's with you in those pains. God's with you in those. But I got to tell you, there's something missing. Something missing in this book. But we'll get to that here in a minute. I want you to start thinking, what's missing in these four simple chapters? Let me tell you a little more about what Paul's going through. Paul's in prison. He knows he's going to die, and it's going to be a brutal death. And, And he's uncomfortable. I mean, he's in just tormented ways of hot and cold and chained to a guard. But you realize Paul can't move. Earlier this year, I was in Vietnam. And I was in the Hanoi Hotel where a lot of American POWs were kept. And it was unbelievable to where they would just be sitting there on a slab this high off the ground and their legs shackled. And they could lay down or sit up. There's no moving your legs. This is also where people went to the bathroom. Right there where they sat. Right where they're laid. Paul is going through the same thing. Paul is sitting and standing in raw sewage. Paul's barely getting fed, if getting fed at all. Paul's going through a horrible time, but remember, Paul's saying, I say again, rejoice. Right? He said, help this person, help that person, help that person. My brother says, I love you. He's writing this in these horrible conditions. What is Paul going through? This is amazing. Here's another thing. Paul's also writing this because some people in his church are talking bad about him. How do you and I act when people talk bad about us? If you think about it, we usually get really upset, don't we? We want God to smite them. Not you, these other people. You guys are great, right? But we do. We want God to punish people who hurt us, don't we? Who talk bad about us. Listen, I'm going to tell you now, you may not know this, but I'm going to let you know now. I know when you talk bad about me. Satan makes sure of it because he's punishing me too, right? You don't like the way, you, I, don't, I didn't get the dimple right in the middle today. You may be offended, I don't know, right? But you may not understand what I'm trying to do here at the church and how I'm trying to grow it and how I'm trying to love people. You don't understand the battles I'm going through behind the scenes. There's all these different things, but we are so... I don't want to say self-centered, but self-focused. We want things our way, right? We act like church is Burger King, right? We, we want our, our Whopper our way. Listen, at the end of the day, I don't even get my Whopper the way I want, right? It's God's way, right? And, and you know what the difference is? Even if you talk bad about me, I love you. Do you even realize that? I love you whether you like me or not. See, my, my love for you is not conditional on whether you love me. My love for you is conditional on the way God loves me. Jesus even says this, if you only love those who love you, what reward will you get? I'm a very competitive person. I want all the reward I can get. So you can be mad at me all you want, and I'm going to love you to death, right? What if we all took that attitude? What if we begin to love each other, no matter what? Whether people understand you, whether people accept you, just love people. And remember, they're a child of God. Instead of falling for the bait of Satan, getting all upset, getting twisted because somebody called you a name, sticks and stones, right? What if we just stopped bellyaching and started loving, right? The way God wants you to. God wants you to love those around you, whether they love you or not. God loves us whether we love him or not. Remember, Christ died for us while we were still sinners. Your love for other people should not be conditional on whether they love you back, even whether they like you or not. See, if you're waiting for them to like you, you're you're living your life in happiness, not in joy. Happiness is your environment. Joy is your relationship. The more you love, you allow God to love you, and the more you recognize that God loves you while you're a mess, right? We're all a mess, aren't we? But we're God's mess. You're not perfect. Neither am I. No one is. 
And so just accept yourself for who you are, love yourself, but start to realize God really loves me. And he knows every rotten thing I did, right? I, I, I have people come in my office and they're like, in, in divorce counseling, like, Brad, I don't love her anymore. And she'll be like, I don't love him anymore either. It's a trick. And I look at him and I'm like, I'm not in love with my wife today either. They're like, what? I'm like, I'm not. They're like, you don't? I was like, no, I'm not in love with my wife today, but I love my wife. She knows every rotten thing about me. She knows all the dumb stuff I've done this morning, right? But if I take the time and slow down and I look at her, I'll fall back in love with her. Sometimes we condition. We think we always got to be in love, right? Listen, any of us been married any time at all, you realize love is like the book of Psalms. It goes up and down and up and down. But you know what? Whether it's the highs or the lows, you know what's always there? Love. Amen. A deep relationship, commitment of love. Read the book of Psalms. You'll see King David. One minute he's on the top of the mountain. The next chapter he's down on the bottom. But through it all, there's love. He may not be in love because in love is an emotion of the environment. Love is a commitment, right, on the relationship. You tracking with me? Define joy. You've got to realize it's about the relationship. It's not about the environment. Paul is in a horrible environment. He's in prison. He's going to die. He, he's sitting and laying and sleeping in raw sewage. He's cold. He's hot. He's uncomfortable. People are talking bad about him. And what's he say? Rejoice. Have joy. You know what you don't read in these four chapters? I gave you a hint. You don't ever hear Paul complain. There's not one word of complaint. At no point in time is Paul saying, Lord, I'm serving you. Why are you doing this to me? Lord, I brought donuts to church today. How could you treat me this way? Right? And think about it, we do that so many times. Lord, I gave my life to you. Lord, I did this for you. And Lord, I did that for you. And why are you letting go? That's all of us, right? It's okay. God's big enough to take it. But imagine yourself like I wasn't that, that bear blind, like you're in a child's playpen. You ever see a kid in a playpen? Ah! They got a poopy diaper. Or maybe they're hungry. I don't know. And imagine God looking down on you in your plain pen. He loves you even in the midst of a mess. Because he's a good father. He sees your cry. He sees your pain. Right? He's going to pick you up in time. Remember what we talked about months ago? Whenever Jesus is walking on water and the disciples are there, they're in a storm, everything's going apart, and Jesus is about to walk past them. Remember the scripture says... I'm going to meet you on the other side. Listen, sometimes we go through seasons like my devotion this past week. We go through hard seasons. We're going to go through good seasons. If you're going through a hard season, realize God is trusting you. You're learning. You're getting seasoned, right? Those who, who get all upset over the smallest thing, they're in no comparison to the person who's been through a lot. Sometimes God's going to let you go through rough seasons so he could make you wiser. Season you a little more. Help you mature. You ever notice we go through the hardest times is what brings out maturity in us? You don't mature in easy seasons of life. You mature through hard times. And God knows that. Because Jesus was fully God and fully human. And he realizes you're going to have trouble. Remember, in this world you will have trouble. And God will allow us to go through trouble. Because he's preparing us for bigger trouble. Remember, this isn't your home. This isn't your home. God's calling you to heaven. And, and there's only one way to get to heaven unless he comes back today, right? We're going to go through seasons. Not all seasons are good. Some seasons are going to be hard. But he's going to be with you in all of it. Don't base your joy on your environment. Can we just admit this is a broken world? Full of broken people, right? Right? trying to act like we're going to get whoppers our own way. We don't want the pickles. We don't want the onions. We don't, it's not the way it works. The world is full of people like you and I, full of free will. And sometimes we use our free will to hurt each other and ourselves. Amen. Just remember, you're still getting to eat. 
You may not get all the food you want or all the veggies you want, but you still got a meal. Maybe the world isn't going the way you want, but you still got God. God's there with you. As a matter of fact, it, it, it says this in Lamentations chapter 3. It's God's will that nobody be punished. God doesn't want you to be hurt like a good father. None of us parents really want to see our kids suffer, but we also understand that's part of life. Amen? So listen, this morning here, I'm going to close with us thinking about this. What are you missing in your life for you to find peace? Maybe you don't have peace, and maybe, maybe you're putting Jesus first, and maybe you're not at war with God or yourself with others, but you're still missing peace. Maybe this morning we can differentiate the difference between our environment and the relationship. Your environment's always going to go back and forth. You're going to have blessed seasons. And when you're in those good seasons, praise God. Celebrate those. Literally celebrate those. And when you're in a, you're in a hard season, maybe the scripture says be still and know. It is the best antidote. Right? Not just be still, but... Be still and know. Just know God loves you. Know that God hasn't forgotten you. Know that God loves you. He doesn't want this for you, but he'll use it to mature you. Amen? God's got a purpose you and I don't know. I, a long time ago, you know, I, I said this. If you knew what it took for you to get where you are today, you wouldn't do it, would you? But God does. He knows the challenges you need to face. He knows the hurdles you're going to have to overcome. Why? Because he loves you and he's going to allow you to do it. Sometimes he may use the pain you walk through to minister to other people. Remember I said this morning, love everybody whether they love you and for to be there for them. One of the best things you can say is, I've been there. I've been hurt. Or maybe you've not been through what they've been through. Maybe the best thing is say, hey, I love you. I'm sorry. Can I just sit with you in your pain? God's a good God. He answers our prayers and our continued prayers. God is with you. It's about the relationship. Relationships are moments of joy and moments of tears. But he's there through it all. I asked this this morning. Will you let God be part of a deeper relationship with you. That the environment around you will no longer bother it. It won't distract it. You're, you have a deeper commitment of love and peace, knowing that God's going to walk through with you all the way through till the very end. Amen? Amen? Can I pray with you this morning? Heavenly Father, God, we love you. Father, be with us. Father, hear our prayers and our hurts and our pains this morning. Lord, would you tend to us? Remind us you love us. You've got a plan to get us out of the problems in our lives. Those things that are tripping us up in our environment. Lord, while maybe we're not in a physical prison being tormented like Paul, Lord, I know many of us, your children are here and around the world are in emotional prisons, shackled to pain, stewing in problems not comfortable with what's going on in the world Lord would you chain yourself to us chain us that you be our guard not the guard of prison but the guard of freedom that you will protect us for when Satan the evil one comes and whispers and speaks and yells at us Lord we seek peace Lord give us our joy back that we can praise you in the middle of a storm. Lord, help us today. Lord, we know you sent Jesus Christ, your only son, as a gift of peace. So Lord, we receive him this morning. And Lord, also, help us to be cheerful. Help us to be joyous. Sometimes in the midst of trials and tribulations. That this Christmas season and every day of life after this, we be in a season of joy no matter what the world brings we're going to praise you we're going to call out to you and we're going to thank you even when we don't understand thank you Lord for trusting us 
for the seasons in our lives that we don't know. We know you have a plan. And Lord, we'll have faith. We'll blindly follow you in these seasons because we know you know best. Our plans always fall short, but your plan is always bringing the greatest. Lord, thank you for this wonderful church. Thank you for those who are here physically today and those watching online. Lord, thank you for the Redeemer who redeems us, each and every one of us, when we call on to him. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.